I would, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague over at Gallatin, uh, Professor Millery Polinay. Millery's teaching and research interests examine the history of US African-American and Afro-Caribbean intellectual thought, coloniality in the Americas, human rights and dictatorship, race and sports. He's published articles and journals such as Small Acts, Caribbean Studies, and the Journal of Haitian Studies. The author of From Douglas to Duvalier, U.S. African Americans, Haiti and Pan-Africanism, 1870 to 1964, from the University Press of Florida, and the co-editor of The Haiti Reader, History, Politics, Culture from Duke. Polonais was the recipient of the 2012 National Endowment for the Arts Schomburg Scholar in Residence Fellowship, and a 2005 University of Rochester Frederick Douglass Postdoctoral Fellowship. Millery, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, again, my name is Millery Poliné, and I'm your moderator for today. Uh, welcome to you all to the uh, Where Do We Go From Here conference. Uh, I'm so looking forward to Professor Kenny's, Kevin Kenny's talk titled The American Irish and Race in the 19th Century. Uh, if you have questions, please, you, uh, you can place them into the chat um, or at the end of the talk, you may uh, raise your hand and I will call on you to, to ask your question. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Kenny. Uh, Kevin Kenny is Professor of History and Glutzman Professor in Irish Studies at New York University. He received his PhD in American History from Columbia University. And to, in, the, uh, in 1994, where his dissertation won the Bancroft Award. He taught at the University of Texas in the mid to late 90s and at Boston College from 1999 to 2018. His first book, Making Sense of the Molly Maguires from Oxford University Press, examines how traditions of Irish rural protests were transplanted into industrial America. His second book, the American Irish, a history published by Longman Press, offers a general survey of the field. And the third book, Peaceable Kingdom Lost, also from uh, Oxford University Press, analyzes the unraveling of William Penn's utopian vision of harmonious coexistence between Native Americans and European colonists. Professor Kenny's latest book, Diaspora, a very short introduction, published with Oxford again, examines the origins, meaning, and utility of a central concept in the study of migration, with particular reference to Jewish, African, Irish, and Asian history. He's also the editor of Ireland and the British Empire with Oxford, and New Directions in Irish American History, published by uh, University of Wisconsin Press, and he has published articles on immigration in the Journal of American History, and the Journal of American Ethnic History among other venues. He's currently working on a book about the immigration policy and slavery in the United States in the period from the American Revolution through Reconstruction. Take it away, Professor Kenny. Great, uh, thank you, Millery. It's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, you thank you to uh, Kim and Miriam for putting together this conference. Uh, it's wonderful for me as director of Ireland House uh, not to be involved in the planning, uh, but simply to be a participant and to be able to uh, enjoy all the papers. There's an awful lot of work goes into planning uh, an online conference and all tiny little things that can go wrong that are really stressful. Everything is going flawlessly, but I do want to thank um, David Hall and Amber Celedonio uh, behind the scenes in Ireland House and all of the people who, who are working with Kim um, to put this together in Gallatin. So I um, hope I haven't just uh, jinxed my own talk by saying how well uh, this is going. And I'm looking forward to um, giving you a presentation. I'll, I'll speak for about half an hour, uh, maybe a few minutes more than that. And then really interested in getting a conversation going. My topic following on from Professor Olmeyer's this morning is uh, the American Irish and race uh, in the 19th century. So in the middle of the 19th century, the Irish were the dominant immigrant presence in the cities and towns of the United States. They entered a distinctive racial hierarchy 
rooted in the largest system of chattel slavery in the history of the world. In this context, Irish immigrants were perpetrators of racism, often of the most violent kind, as for example, in their opposition to abolitionism and anti-slavery, in the notorious draft riots of 1863, and in Chinese uh, exclusion movements in the 1870s and 1880s. That's uh, part of the story. They were also on the receiving end of anti-immigrant prejudice of a kind that some historians have described as racist. Uh, other historians, including myself, uh, might search for a different terminology. So in my presentation today, uh, I want to do four things. I want to begin with an overview of Irish immigration in this period, the nativist response to the Irish and some of the cultural stereotypes they endured. Secondly, I want to situate my argument in the historiography, uh, including what is now a, an older debate concerning how the Irish supposedly became white. Thirdly, I want to shift the focus uh, away from what we often do, which is the social history of immigrants, to look at immigration uh, in the context of policy and to link immigration policy to the dominant political fact of the 19th century, which is slavery. And then finally, on that basis, I'm I'll draw some more general reflections about the um, position of Irish immigrants and indeed European immigrants more generally in the United States. Okay. So the Irish uh, were the largest immigrant group in the United States in the mid 19th century. They accounted for 45% of all arrivals in the 1840s, 35% in the 1850s. They were highly visible, uh, especially in cities. One in four New Yorkers by 1860 was Irish born. American nativists didn't like what they saw. They objected to how the Irish dressed and smelled how they spoke and drank, how they worshipped and voted. And while prejudice has a way of producing its own statistics, Irish immigrants topped the charts in figures for arrests, imprisonment, confinement in poorhouses and mental hospitals. Were such people really fit candidates for American citizenship and assimilation, the nativists asked. Well, at the heart of this anti-Irish sentiment was religion. Most of the immigrants were Catholic, coming into a predominantly Protestant country. Would they be loyal to the United States or to Rome? Would they think independently about politics or would they answer to their priests? Was the very structure of the Roman Catholic Church hierarchical and authoritarian? compatible with Republican values? And why did Irish Catholics want to organize their own schools instead of sending their children through the public schools, one of the uh, crowning glories of America's experiment in Republican democracy? These were some of the questions the nativists asked. Economic considerations were even more important. The Irish came to the United States just as the Industrial Revolution was taking off. As wage labor became increasingly common, American-born workers found older paths of social mobility blocked. The Irish were the poorest and the most disadvantaged immigrants the United States had seen. Unable or unwilling to move upward through the social scale, they seemed to signal the arrival of class stratification and class conflict of a kind considered typical of Europe, not America. The tendency of Irish immigrants to work for low wages in unskilled labor, along with their use as strike breakers, provoked considerable hostility from native born American workers. And in a familiar pattern in US immigration history, Irish Americans soon came to harbor similar sentiments against African Americans and Chinese Americans. Um, I was inspired by listening to Professor Olmeyer this morning to uh, at, include at least some slides from my presentation. I'm not an image-driven historian. Dave, if you can run um, slide number one at this point, please do. And if you can't, I will proceed. 
Okay, so I, I, I want to include just a few images in my presentation. Uh, this is a famous image um, by a famous cartoonist, Thomas Nast. Uh, he brought us Father Christmas and Santa Claus. He also um, um, brought us a series of uh, anti-Irish images. Here you see Lady Liberty in the middle protecting a Chinese laborer known as a coolie laborer, a racialized figure uh, in its own right. Uh, to her left, uh, you see the mob, you see the, the familiar simian uh, features of the Irishman in the middle, you see coded references in the back, colored orphan asylum, which is a reference to the draft riots of 1863, as I'll explain, you see a noose uh, hanging from a tree. Uh, Dave, if you would unshare screen, we won't get back to images again for, uh, until later. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. So during the political crisis of the 1850s, nativism assumed a political power unmatched uh, before or since in American history. Uh, to the extent that the United States is a nation of immigrants, it's also always a nation of anti-immigrants, a nation of nativists. But in the 1850s, something distinctive happens, which is that cultural impulse of nativism takes on a political form. Divided over slavery, the Whig party went into terminal decline in the early 1850s. And for a while, it looked as though a new political coalition, the American party, known uh, to us as the Know Nothings, uh, might become the main opposition party to the Democrats. That would be a remarkable thing in the context of the breakdown of the two-party political system and nativist party steps into the vacuum. Now, the know-nothings were bitterly hostile to immigrants, especially Irish Catholics. They called for a federal law mandating a 21-year waiting period for naturalization, or failing that, an equally lengthy post-naturalization period before naturalized immigrants could vote. Between 1854 and 1856, know-nothing politicians controlled the legislative branches in six states and won gubernatorial elections in nine. They were strongest in states with sizable uh, immigrant populations, especially Massachusetts, where the Irish-born percentage of the population was highest. In 1857, the Massachusetts legislature passed an anti-Irish literacy law requiring voters to demonstrate their ability to write their own names and read the constitution with a grandfather clause exempting citizens over 60 who had previously voted. Like many national institutions, however, the Know Nothing Party was torn asunder by slavery, the dominant political question of the day. Northern nativists saw Irish immigrants as agents not only of popery, but of the pro-slavery Democratic Party. Southern know-nothings, by contrast, defended the institution of slavery. The party was unable to hold its pro-slavery and anti-slavery wings together. And in 1856, the uh, know-nothing candidate, former President Millard Fillmore, placed a distant third in the presidential election. A new party, single issue, single section, the Republican Party running on an anti-slavery platform, placed second. The victorious Democrats, the party of immigrants and the party of slavery, won the election. Okay, so even in Massachusetts, where nativism was strongest, the Know Nothings never succeeded in restricting Irish immigration or even in delaying the waiting period for naturalization. The best they could do in 1859 was to impose a two-year waiting period on voting after naturalization. So put another way, uh, the Irish endured plenty of prejudice and some discrimination. But let's take a look at uh, the evidence to see and try and determine exactly what forms did this discrimination take. Well, we know that the Irish were subject to widespread stereotyping, uh, much of it satirical in form. The stereotypes range from the mild and comic, for those who like that kind of thing, to the vicious and derogatory, running across a spectrum that included the dull-witted but harmless comic uh, figure of Pat or Mick, 
with his Irish bulls and illogical banter, to the somewhat menacing Pat or Paddy with a projecting mouth and jaw, to the full-blown simianized figure of Paddy, a cross between a man and an ape. And again, uh, David, if you could pull up the next image, please. Look on this picture and then on that, William Shakespeare, uh, Florence Nightingale, as distinct from Bridget McBruiser. I don't especially enjoy looking at these images anymore, uh, which is why I hadn't uh, uh, um, necessarily necessary wanted to include them. Dave, if you would go to the next image, please. The day we celebrate, St. Patrick's Day, uh, take a look at the, at, at the uh, faces of the, um, again, the simianized features of the rioters in the center and to the uh, right-hand side of the image, the figure, um, that's my right, the figure um, holding something in his left hand. What is it? It's a piece of, it's a cobblestone, uh, also known as Irish uh, confetti in New York City in the mid-19th century. Uh, Next image, uh, please, David. Again, you see this is by uh, Thomas Nast. Uh, Everything obnoxious to us shall be abolished. I think we're quite familiar with these images. Uh, David, if you go back away from share screen, please. The question for me as a historian uh, is, well, what do they mean? What do these images mean? Citing images of this sort, uh, some historians have suggested an anti-Irish racism comparable to that inflicted on people of African descent in the Americas. Uh, my own reading is that these derogatory images offer us insights into the minds of anti-Irish bigots, more insights than we might like to know. Uh, but they don't tell us much about the quotidian reality of immigrant life. What do the Irish think of themselves? Well, the Irish were not in the habit of reading the middle-class magazines where these images were published. If they had done so, they would not have recognized themselves. The images, in, in other words, tell us a lot about cultural prejudice, uh, but little about its impact. That said, portraying the poor uh, and the foreign born in brutish terms uh, was standard practice uh, in the 19th century Atlantic world, but the full blown Paddy was a uniquely bestialized figure. And uh, why? And I'd say much of the answer has to do with the association of the Irish with particular forms of violence. A rough and boisterous urban culture featuring heavy drinking and gang life a tradition of collective violence rooted in the Irish countryside that crossed the Atlantic in the form of faction fights and secret societies, notoriously in the case of the Molly Maguires of Pennsylvania, deep animosity between Irish Catholics and Protestants that spilled over into violent confrontations, again, on the streets of New York in 1870 and 1871 in the Orange and Green riots and then forms of nationalism uh, that advocated the use of physical force in Ireland and dynamite campaigns in British cities to liberate Ireland from British rule. Uh, David, if you'd bring up that last image, please. This is actually from a British newspaper in 1881. It's part of a... Um, an Atlantic discourse, uh, the most recently discovered wild beast uh, bred in the United States. Uh, look at the figure in the cage with, with uh, stars and stripes with something around his um, waist, presumably an explosive device labeled an Irish and American dynamite skunk. In, if you look even more closely and it's deliberately vague in the cell to his left is another one. You can see the face. And if we were to go into, we could do this in the Q&A, if we were to go into uh, this in detail, we would figure out that the figure in the middle wearing the bonnet is uh, William Gladstone. And he is handing a pill, in other words, a concession to the dynamite skunk. Uh, 
So the, um, but the, it's the racialized figure of the Irish American dynamite skunk that I find so shocking. And uh, look at the tail. Uh, when I uh, show this with my students, we don't always see the tail. Uh, look at the tail. Okay, thank you, David. If you go back to the main presentation. Okay, and then the, the final aspect of the association with violence is opposition to the abolition of slavery in the antebellum period and fear of labor competition from African Americans in the throughout the century. Uh, all of these things uh, together, I think, certainly explain uh, why we see these hostile re uh, representations. Now, the last of these examples is of particular relevance in my presentation today. To build and protect their precarious niche in the American economy, Irish immigrants drove African Americans out of work on the docks and uh, from other forms of manual labor, replaced them in domestic service, forced them out of neighborhoods like Five Points in New York City. Deep-rooted animosity to Irish Americans uh, by Irish Americans uh, to African Americans, aggravated by the Emancipation Proclamation and the Conscription Act of 1863, exploded in violence uh, in July of that year on the streets of New York City. Irish workers lashed out against symbols of power and privilege, especially those connected with the federal government, conscription, and the anti-slavery Republican Party. The rioters harassed, beat, and lynched African Americans and burned the colored orphan asylum to the ground. We've seen a coded reference to that in the first uh, political cartoon I showed you. Contemporary nativists, who had good reason to exaggerate, estimated the number killed in the riots at 1,200 or even 1,500. The official police figure is 119 dead, and most of them were rioters. And that figure is probably too low. Elite Protestant Northerners responded to the violence by reducing the Irish to the level of the animal kingdom. In other words, they responded to racism with a form of um, racial uh, imagery. Question still for me is how do we interpret uh, all of these words and images uh, of the kind I've been describing? Okay. So a generation ago, when I received my PhD, the whiteness thesis had just emerged in US labor historiography. This came out of the work of David Rodiger in The Wages of Whiteness, published in 1991. Noel Ignatiev's book, How the Irish Became White, published in 1995. Very influential school of thought. And what it proposed was that the Irish were not initially regarded as white in the United States, but became so by distancing themselves from black people, exerting their agency to acquire a new racial identity. Now, I did not embrace this argument at the time uh, because I felt that the analytical tools already at my disposal, class and to a lesser extent religion, were adequate uh, to the task of explaining the discrimination endured by the Irish and how they fought back. In other words, um, it was clear to me that the Irish engaged in racism against uh, African Americans. It was less clear to me that the prejudice they endured would fall under the same category of race and racism. I was always skeptical about that. There's a conceptual problem here because to pose the question, how did the Irish become white? Uh, presupposes that in some sense they were not white to begin with, that they set out to become white and that they eventually did so. So to say that the American Irish were initially seen as less than white was to claim that they were consigned to an inferior race. The Irish then allegedly set out to acquire whiteness in order to improve their position. Now the imagery is there, I've just uh, shown it to you. But if Irish immigrants could become white and black people by definition could not, then what sort of racism did the Irish experience? 
uh, put another way, to what race had the Irish supposedly been consigned? They could enter the United States with minimal restrictions, settle where they wished, move around, become citizens, exercise the vote, and testify in court. Most African Americans could do none of these things. In the notorious case of Dred Scott versus Sanford in 1857, Chief Justice Roger Tawney ruled with brutal racist logic that African Americans, free as well as enslaved, could not be citizens of the United States because the Constitution did not intend them to be so. So for me, chattel slavery and the Dred Scott decision provide the measure of racism in the United States in the mid 19th century. And without falling into the trap of what one historian recently described as an Olympics of suffering, in other words, uh, which group had it worst, we do need to acknowledge the fundamental difference between African-American and Irish-American history. And once we do so, it's hard for me to see how the same terms, race and racism, can be applied to both experiences without those terms losing their analytical coherence. Uh, Frederick Douglass, who sympathized with the plight of the Irish in Ireland, uh, knew better than most what this meant. Let me give you a long quote from Fre Frederick Douglass. It is often said by the opponents of the anti-slavery cause that the condition of the people of Ireland is more deplorable than that of the American slaves. Far be it from me to underwrite the sufferings of the Irish people. They have been long oppressed. And the same heart that prompts me to plead the cause of the American bondman makes it impossible for me not to sympathize with the oppressed of all lands. Yet, I must say that there is no analogy between the two cases. The Irishman is poor, but he's not a slave. He may be in rags, but he is not a slave. He is still the master of his own body. And poor as may be my opinion of the British Parliament, I cannot believe that it will ever sink to such a depth of infamy as to pass a law for the recapture of fugitive Irishmen. The shame and scandal of kidnapping will long remain wholly monopolized by the American Congress. The Irishman has not only the liberty to emigrate from his country, but he has liberty at home. He can write and speak and cooperate for the attainment of his rights and the redress of his wrongs. Put another way, Irish immigrants were white on arrival in the United States. As soon as they entered the country, they stood on the right side of the color line. They endured plenty of cultural prejudice to be sure, but what impact did it have on their access to naturalization or their civil and political rights? So there's a disparity here between the, the rhetoric of anti-Irish prejudice and its impact. And it's precisely that disparity between rhetoric and impact that led me to wonder really for the first time about the nature of American immigration policy in the 19th century, which is the subject of my current research, um, shifting from social history to the history of policy. So it's a truism today that regulating immigration policy is a federal matter. When a state overreaches in this domain, we assume that the courts will intervene and declare any such measure unconstitutional as an infringement on federal power. And I must say, when I started to teach immigration history, I, I didn't uh, question that assumption. I never really looked at it. Uh, most of my work was social history in which immigrants are the agents. But in my presentation today, what I want to do is shift the focus of studying immigration to the level of law and policy. So to make that move, uh, let me begin with a quote from the legal historian Kunal Parker. The function of a national immigration regime, Parker writes, is to defend a territorial inside from a territorial outside. 
access to and presence within this territorial inside are determined on the basis of whether one is a citizen, a citizen or an alien, where both terms are understood in their formal legal sense. All of the activities we associate with the contemporary US immigration regime, exclusion and deportation, entry checkpoints, border patrols, detention centers, and the like, make sense in these terms, end quote. Now, Parker's purpose in this passage is, is to emphasize that none of these things existed in the United States at the national level before the Civil War and Reconstruction. The meaning of citizenship was notoriously unclear before the 14th Amendment. The Constitution does not define citizenship. And it was the states, rather than the federal government, that regulated the entry of foreigners until the 1880s. This was the context in which most Irish immigrants came to America. Strikingly, for what came to be known as a nation of immigrants, the Constitution says nothing about their admission, exclusion, or expulsion. The Constitution does authorize Congress to establish a uniform rule for naturalization, but this policy applies to immigrants after they have arrived and settled. Congress proceeded to, to pass naturalization laws straight away, starting in 1790. Naturalization after um, a five-year period of residence, proof of good character, and an oath renouncing foreign allegiances, much as we have today. This policy was noticeably liberal, with one glaring exception. The process was open to free white persons only. Not until 1870 was naturalization extended to people of African origin, and only in the 1940s and 1950s were Asian immigrants finally able to become citizens. But naturalization was never an issue for the Irish, except briefly in the 1850s in Massachusetts, and even there the nativists failed. Now, there are a few other grounds on which um, Congress could regulate immigration in the Constitution. I won't go into them here, but we could discuss them in the Q&A. The, I do want to highlight the most important of them, however, and that is the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause in the Constitution gave Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. To regulate commerce with, the, with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. And actually the Commerce Clause is the key to um, jurisprudence on immigration policy in the 19th century. As early as 1824, the Supreme Court clarified that commerce included not just trade, the transport of goods, but also navigation, the transport of people. This decision laid the groundwork for thinking of immigration as a form of commerce, and it suggested that Congress had broad authority in that arena. But power over foreign and interstate commerce, which resided at the federal level, clashed with another form of power. And that was the sovereign power reserved by the individual states in a federalist system of government. In constitutional and political terms, this is what the debate over 19th century immigration policy was about. And at the heart of the, the, this debate was the institution of slavery and policies regulating the movement of free black people. Because the absence of a national immigration policy did not mean that the United States simply had open borders, externally or internally, far from it. Throughout the antebellum period, the states set their own terms, not only for the admission, exclusion, and expulsion of foreigners, but also for the internal movement of free and enslaved black people. They regulated the arrival of foreigners and the movement of people in general by deploying what was known as their police power, insisting that it was their right and their obligation to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Towns and governments throughout the antebellum period passed laws prohibiting the arrival of foreign convicts, requiring shipmasters to post bonds or pay taxes for foreign paupers, and others who might require public support, especially single women and the mentally or physically disabled, ordering the deportation of foreign paupers, quarantining passengers, both native born and foreign born, who carried contagious diseases, 
and confining free black sailors, both British and American, to jail for the duration of their stay in southern ports. All of these measures rested on the police power of the states to regulate their internal affairs, a power that Justice Roger Tony's court was eager to preserve in order to protect slavery. So it's not surprising in this context that the antebellum courts danced around the question of whether state immigration laws violated the federal government's power over commerce rather than confronting that question directly. Because if the Supreme Court invalidated the right of Massachusetts to exclude or deport Irish paupers, what would become of similar laws in South Carolina regulating and punishing colored seamen? Laws in Southern states mandating the expulsion of enslaved people after manumission, or laws in both the North and the South excluding uh, free Black people from the states, from crossing borders between states. The two issues are uh, entirely tangled up. So in a series of court cases, I won't go into the, the details uh, here, except to say that the Supreme Court grappled with this relationship between commerce power at the federal level and uh, the reserved police power of the states, always conscious that any sweeping assertion of federal authority over foreign immigration would have a knock-on effect um, on laws passed by the individual states regulating mobility, especially the mobility of um, free black people, potentially even the internet, interstate uh, slave trade. It was not until 1875, with slavery removed from the picture, that the Supreme Court could finally step in and rule unanimously that the admission of immigrants fell under Congress's exclusive power to regulate foreign commerce, and this decision ushered in the era of federal immigration control. Before 1875, uh, the states controlled immigration admissions. The question then, uh, as I move towards the conclusion, is how did uh, the state level laws and policies uh, affect Irish immigrants? And I'd like to suggest a few tentative answers to that question, uh, designed really to open up possible areas of research. So states, states passed laws requiring ship captains to either post bonds, guaranteeing, uh, uh, put up $300 as a guarantee in case uh, a passenger became uh, a public charge, or pay a head tax of a couple of dollars up front. Um, states passed these laws. Captains uh, responded by either challenging the laws sometimes or just complying, but passing the cost onto the passengers in the form of higher fares. So if you've got to pay a couple of dollars uh, on arrival, um, then you just raise the fare accordingly. It's worth asking whether higher fares prevented Irish people from migrating. Uh, because we know that the poorest of the poor in any migrant situation always struggle to leave. But we also know that the scale of emigrant remittances coming back from America, often in the form of prepaid passage tickets, was very high. So I would say overall, uh, the Irish emigration rate was not uh, suppressed. But it occurs to me that in certain years, a change in policy uh, almost certainly did have a negative, a very negative impact. Uh, it could divert passengers elsewhere. A federal law passed in 1847, mandating greater space for passengers, combined with more stringent taxes introduced uh, by New York State that year, uh, made New York uh, suddenly much more expensive in the context of the famine. And significant numbers of Irish migrants chose to go to Canada instead. And the alarmingly high rates of mortality uh, during transatlantic crossings that summer and at the quarantine station at Gros Isle above Montreal um, are what really create uh, the terrible memory of Black 47. It's an Atlantic uh, ocean uh, uh, creation as, um, as well as something that's happening in Ireland. If the captains chose not to pay, Taxes or fees, uh, they had the option of posting a bond to cover the expenses uh, of indigent and vulnerable passengers um, in case they became a public charge. They 
were, at first they were pretty much inclined to do that because they knew the bonds were really hard to collect. I mean, how are you going to track down uh, the ship captain? How are you going to track down the immigrant? They may, may have moved out of the city altogether. Interestingly, a bond market also emerged uh, with brokers taking on the risk, charging captains a small fee. And then these brokers sometimes evaded paying the bond money to the state by opening their own private uh, arms houses. And you can only imagine what the conditions were like uh, in, a, in a private uh, arm house. And th this is where I think policy has been social history can come to, together in ways that, that are worth uh, exploring. State immigration laws, uh, we need to remember, were not designed really to exclude immigrants, except in a few individual cases, they were designed more to raise money for their upkeep. Distressed and vulnerable passengers could still be admitted uh, so long as captains posted bonds or paid the taxes and fees. A small number of European immigrants were turned away. Nearly all were allowed to enter. And that remained true even under federal control until the 1920s. It's only in the 1920s that exclusion rather than admission becomes normative. It's also important to emphasize that there's a lot more to immigration policy than just regulating uh, arrivals. My focus today is on admissions, but immigrants were also subject to policies controlling their lives after entry. Antebellum Massachusetts had a powerful system for removing paupers after their arrival, including deportation overseas. And this was an extreme case, but I think any account of anti-Irish discrimination at the policy level needs to consider how the poor law system was deployed against immigrants after they arrived. But once again, while some Irish paupers were pushed out to their places of legal settlement within or beyond Massachusetts, potentially even back to Ireland, the poor law system was used much more systematically to exclude free black people from moving between the states. The American Irish never endured restrictions on their interstate movement of this kind. In the case of free black people, the poor laws provided a pretext and a mechanism for racial exclusion within the United States. In the Irish case, laws pertaining to foreign borders and post-entry control were designed to address poverty. And it would be hard uh, for me at least to argue that these laws had a racial content or purpose, unless the term race is used in some loose and general sense as a surrogate for class. But using race in this way uh, drains the word of historical meaning. Okay, to conclude, 19th century America was clearly a good place for foreigners, provided they came from Europe. Immigrants from Europe, including those from Ireland, enjoyed significantly greater privileges than African Americans born on US soil. All European immigrants were much better off than Chinese immigrants, both in the process through which they entered the country and once they settled in the United States. It is no part of my agenda to, uh, today to deny that the Irish endured prejudice. But I do want to distinguish between different kinds of historical experience so that immigrant racism and anti-immigrant prejudice make sense as parts of the same larger history. Evidence of nativist contempt for the Irish throughout the 19th century is abundant. But it is, I think, useful to move beyond nativism as a body of bigoted ideas, which in the end tells us more about the minds of bigots than about how the Irish lived their lives, and to assess the practical impact of anti-immigrant sentiment. One way to begin that task as I've suggested today, is to look at laws and policies as well as the social history of immigrants. Thank you. Um, we are um, taking a lunch break or tea break, depending on the part of the world you're in. We return at 2 p.m. Eastern um, when our wonderful colleague from Quinnipiac University, Professor Christine Keneally, um, is going to give us a paper on two women abolition, black abol two black women abolitionists in Ireland, Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield and Sarah Parker Remond.
It'll be moderated by um, Professor Stephen Small from UC Berkeley himself, um, a renowned scholar of um, the Black experience in particular in Europe and in comparative perspectives. And then at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time, Kim DaCosta, our own Kim, um, will discuss how the Irish became Black, origin stories, genealogies, and a usable past. That will be moderated by um, Professor Liam Kennedy, the director of the Clinton Institute for American Studies at University College Dublin. We're really grateful that um, Liam is going to stay up late on a Friday evening to moderate that. Um, please use the same Zoom link that you used to access um, this morning. Send us an email at ireland.house if you have any housekeeping questions or, or, ish, or any uh, issues. We did record that and we do ho hope to publish on our website as much of these proceedings as we possibly can. And please come back with more chat and uh, questions later. And thank you again, uh, Kevin and Millery. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Thank you. Bye, Kevin. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Take care.